Douglas' popular sovereignty was let the people Let the people decide. in each territory decide for themselves. Decide yeah. for themselves what they want to do. What they want to do, yeah. And have a vote on it. That sounds like a great idea. Of course, eventually what happened was slavery came out and fought everywhere. But uh, Douglas was saying that on popular sovereignty, people say, but again, it's a case where you make a promise and the first intending to keep it and find that you can't. And the first state to leave the Union was South Carolina. First state to leave the Union was South Carolina, yes. And then North followed, and then everything out of there. Now, what does it mean they hesitated? Oh, well, they see, hesitated. here's what South Carolina was, they we're going to leave, we're going to leave. And when it came time to actually show down, <coughs> They looked around, oh, are you going to leave too? I mean, are you going to leave? Or who else is going to leave with us? And if the other states hadn't fallen with Steve, they might not have left. But I mean, okay, they had basically, I mean, it's, I, I understand human nature. <coughs> you know what you're going to do you until it comes it time to do it. Then, well, uh, do I really want to do this? Yeah. Okay, so basically they were making a decision based on what other people they, no. they more or less said, they might say they what, they, what they wanted to do. In other words, they, they had the telegraph. They didn't have a telephone, they had the telegraph, and they started inquiring of the governors and leaders of the other states, what's your state going to do? What's your state going to do? And uh, eventually they, they uh, decided to leave. And they were the first state to leave, but they did not leave as fast as the city. Keep in mind, too, the way the election returns came in in those days, it took weeks to determine that Lincoln was elected. Now, okay, now I have a question about Harriet Tubman. Harriet yeah. Tubman, was she the, was she Grandma Moses or Grandma Moses? No, Grandma no Moses two, two, she knew that. Two, two separate, separate persons. People? Both of them because, black women. Okay, my, my, my fiance was thinking that they were the same person. Yeah. No, they're, 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 no, they're, they're separate. Person. Harriet Tubman was a different person. And Grandma Moses, that's what I thought as well, because yeah. in your lecture you said Harriet Tubman and Grandma Moses. Oh yeah, they were two different women. They, they were both the they were doing. And they both went into slave camps and pulled the slaves out. Grandma Moses at the point of a pistol revolver knows you're coming whether you want to or not. Yeah. Yeah. You're coming whether you want to or not. And the slaves... So a badass bitch. She's a badass. Yeah, no, no. Okay. <laughs> if you want to stay, I'm going to shoot you. Sorry, I didn't mean to tease that. Yeah. But it's, it's, she was a badass. No, no. In a good way. And what's more, both women managed to elude the, 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 the southern cops. I mean, you know, they both, they would come down and, and the cops couldn't catch them. The southern cops in the time. And they credited it with God's divine protection. Right, okay. All right, I've got to move on. Yeah, good question. We're starting at It's 19. 105 and it's chapter 9. 19, probably not 19. What? Chapter 19, all right. Um, the What's city. I am on, on my book. I'm on page 483. But uh, anyway, this would be second semester American. If I were teaching it, you might say the right way. Basically, this is about the cities that started to become really, really big in, in between, between 1870 and 1900. And one of the things that made the uh, cities so big was the invention of structural steel. This meant that skyscrapers could become bigger and bigger. Structural steel was not only used in skyscrapers, but it was used in bridges. It meant that bridges could become, well, bigger. Uh, the old wooden bridge would do well to, to, for a small creek. But structural steel, uh, now steel is lighter than iron and it's stronger than iron and less prone to rust than iron is. And uh, it was used to, uh, now, I was reading a couple days ago that on the moon there's some rust-proof iron that does not occur in nature on Earth. And they found it and nobody was willing to go up and get it. And anyway, uh, it might, if we could get a hold of it, it might greatly change our manufacturing system. But that's just one of the things. On the moon? On the moon, yeah. The moon has several things about it. And strangely enough, we don't know that. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, my good take. And in his weak moments, he opened up. All right. Um, anyway, we had structural steel, and it meant that skyscrapers. Now, in the, the 1870s, so a big fire occurred in Chicago. 
called the Chicago Fire. We don't know what started it, but it burnt much of the city of Chicago. But the good news is, when the fire was over and finally put out, they rebuilt the city with skyscrapers that were 10 and 20 stories tall. Now today, of course, Chicago has the country's tallest building now, the Sears Tower. I believe it's the tallest building in the country. Isn't that the one in uh, Seattle? Maybe that one's now bigger. I don't know. That, that changes from time to time. But for many, many three years, it was the Empire State Building. But anyway, I don't know. The biggest skyscraper I've heard, though, is in Yemen, in that graveyard. Mm -hmm. that, that thing is so huge that it has its own weather. But anyway, leaving that, uh, they rebuilt the city of Chicago. Um, the people began moving from farm to city, and um, owing in part to the fact that they could get a job in the city. Now, most people had to move near the jobs because the automobile was not in widespread use. And most men who worked, and women walked to work. You get up in the morning and walk maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half to work. So you had to live near your factory. And a lot of factories began providing housing for its workers called factory housing. Now, my grandfather lived in a factory house one time that President Roosevelt, who eventually got all those things in the thirds. Now, in Disney World, now they somehow get away with it. If you work for Disney, you can live on the Disney reservation. Um, my daughter did for a while. But uh, it's basically, you work for Disney and live in Disney housing, and only Disney workers work, can live there. It was similar to these factory housing. Only factory workers who worked for that particular factory could live there. And you had the company store, and you were expected to buy everything at the company store. So basically, the company, the company paid you your wage, and then you went and spent all your money at the company store. Spent what you didn't spend there, you had to spend on rent, which also went to the company. So basically, the company got you their money back after they paid you. Because um, you lived there. Because you lived there. And then also, you were expected to shop at the company store, and the other stores were too far away for you to walk. So uh, this, this went on for. Wow. Um, what was the invention of the car? The, the car, now that is, I'm glad you asked that. That is a really, really tough question to answer because your history books, well, your historians simply don't know who invented the automobile. It's just that when the time was right, a whole bunch of them appeared at once. And uh, some of them were electric. What was holding it back? Like, that's what's that? What was holding back the invention of the car? When the time came, it was like the phone. Everybody, but a lot of people put them together. I mean, when you had the technology, as in the case of the phone, 70 men came to invented it. And Bell had the documentation, so his name was a public course. In the case of the car, people would put them together in their garages and drive them around, but nobody knows who put the first one together. Now, just when the technology was right, now, when somebody figured out how to put a piston inside a cylinder, I mean, in the case of Henry Ford, he did not invent a car, but uh, he figured out a way to make it cheap. But he actually had his wife, let's see, pour the gasoline in the cylinders while he opened the valves with his hand. In other words, that's the time for the intake valves. So he'd open the valve, mm -hmm. then he'd close the valves. There'd be the power compression stroke, then a the power stroke. When the power stroke, he'd open the exhaust valve, and that's the exhaust valve. He'd open the valve with his hand. Uh, just to prove it could be, you know, that he could get his engine to work. Then eventually he geared it. If you know what you think about a car, he eventually geared the valves where they opened the. the, the. But, uh, but when, again, when the technology was there, a bunch of men put it together, and we don't know who's first. Nobody knows who invented the car. Nobody knows. It's just, but they they appeared. But most of them, uh, they credit Kokomo, Indiana, as being the first. Several cars started roaring out of Kokomo's garages for a while, or Kokomo's barns, not just garages, but barns. These men would assemble them in barns, and then... Uh, There's a bunch of people that created it. It's, it's unknown. Yeah, and again, we don't know, we don't know who made the first one. Um, all right. Um, now, we turn to page 490, and we come to an issue that is very, very contemporary. I mean, going on at this moment. Cry for immigration restriction. All right, racism in the city, racism and the cry for immigration restriction. A lot of people felt that you were taking in too many foreigners, 
and they wanted to restrict it. Particularly, they wanted to restrict it to, I mean, I'm going to say it, but it's white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, otherwise known as Wasps. They were trying to keep out Catholics. Now, again, folk, not that I want to prejudice any of you against Catholicism, but anti-Catholic sentiment is, runs like a thread through our history. And it emerged during my own lifetime when John Kennedy ran for president in 1960. It emerged rather strongly at that time. But, uh, but again, they wanted to keep out certain types of people. Um, and that is still going on at this, at this moment. So, but I want you to know, a lot of the problems that we face today, a lot of us have gotten, it's nothing new. Um, now, a lot of your uh, Africans left the South and went into places like Detroit and Chicago and Newark, New Jersey, and Middletown, Ohio, and they went to the industrial areas, hoping to get jobs. Now, I have to say this, I mean, being a Northerner, they found out in a lot of cases discrimination was worse in the North than it had been in the South. The churches, I mean, in the South, blacks and whites were at least worshiping the same churches. In the North, they started having the blacks go to one church and the whites go to another. And this went on even as recently as when I was a child. Um, we'd have our big, what they call district meetings, and there'd be a bunch of black people come to this meeting. They were all from this one black church in our denomination. Um, Again, everybody knew that the blacks were to be in separate churches from the whites. That, that was the rule at the time. Um, more so in the north than the south. And uh, this, again, discrimination was worse in the north than it was in the south. And the north was more hypocritical about it. Um, Italians, there was a common name for Italians. They were sometimes called Dagos. Uh, I don't know if that's a derogatory term or not, but uh, my father's sister married an Italian man named Achelis. So uh, I had some relatives who were part Italian. I had a friend when I was growing up who came from Italy. Now, um, Here is the bad part of it, folks. And all right, I have done some genealogical research, and in my genealogical research, I learned that my great grandfather, William Wallace Cunningham, had to quit work at ten and go to work in a wool mill. Now the city was Cadiz, Ohio, but basically this was a problem. It's called child labor. Now, with all respect, the child labor people would argue that. Um, hey, these children have to work their father's farm, so what's the difference? I mean, you know, as a child would grow up and start looking for hen eggs as when he was as young as five or six years old and run a risk of being copperhead bit, and you had to learn, hey, don't ever put your hand anywhere when you can't see what's in your hand. Now, a relative of mine reached over to pick up some hen eggs and there was a copperhead in the nest, but he didn't see it, so he reached up and reached over and got bit. And uh, anyway, you had to learn the things like that, but t t children would work the farm, but uh, they would say, well, why can't children work the factories? The children were paid pennies a day, and they worked long hours, 12 hours or more a day, from 12 to 16 hours a day, usually. They had to quit school, and again, uh, they all, all of his brothers and sisters would quit school at 10 and go work in the factory. Quit school at 10 and go work in the factory. Uh, and uh, this eventually was outlawed, this practice of child labor. But uh, yeah, the girls did too. Now boys and girls alike. Eventually you developed white collar workers as well, and blue collar workers, a difference. The white collar workers were the managers, the women who typed, the typers, the sales clerks, they were white collar, expected to be clean. Your blue collar workers were the persons who did the dirty work worked on the assembly lines, assembled, they did work with the weavers, worked with the machinery, and oftentimes did the dangerous work. Um, eventually, women became secretaries, but if you watch some of the old movies, they'll show male secretaries. All of Abraham Lincoln's secretaries were men. I believe that's right. And um, if you watch the movie Eight Men Out about the Black Sox scandal of 1919, the baseball managers all had male secretaries at the time. 
the idea of a woman secretary was to come later. But most of the secretaries were men. Um, now, then came the issue of unions. Unions were resisted storm of management. And I want to tell you, I mean, this is something that's my, I mean, that during the summer, during the, pardon me, between January and June, the last month, I worked for Bob Lowe's part time. And my daughter hired another Lowe's. And lesson number one they gave you in her training is don't listen to anyone. If you if I, we find out you're talking union talk, you're going to go. My Aunt Rosie, who's still alive, she's in her 80s now. She worked at a sewing factory up in Jamestown, Kentucky for many years, but she got fired one day. They caught her trying to organize for union. Um, I worked with a union at Lockheed. Lockheed had them, the aerospace union. But unions is where the workers get together and they collectively bargain with their management for things like pay and benefits and the time off, vacations and whatever. To get their way, unions will oftentimes resort to strikes. People will argue that the strike usually did not gain for the union workers very much. In other words, the time they lost, the wages they lost during the strike was never made up for. But I told my father-in-law one time, when, before he died, he said, you don't gain as much as you lose because we went on a seven-week strike at Bucky all the time. He said, you'll never gain that back. I said, but you fought in World War II, and were you fighting for yourself, or were you fighting for other people besides yourself? And I said that the main reason we do is for not only for us, but for people who will come after us. And a lot of the times the unions gained very little, but the little bit they gained over generations added up. Until after a while, maybe 50 years or more, it became a lot. Eventually, child labor was outlawed. Eventually, uh, excessively hard work was outlawed. Eventually, the company was forced to give breaks to its workers and give lunch breaks as well as uh, morning breaks and afternoon breaks. All this, uh, they were, and uh, they were forced to pay their workers something like a competitive wage thanks in large part to the efforts of union. But there was no one strike that did it, no one um, incident that did it. It took a lot of time. Um, some of the main unions were the Knights of Labor, that was the first union, followed by, I'm gonna write this down, it won't be on a test, followed by the American Federation of Labor, uh, the AFL. Eventually the AFL merged with the Congress and Industrial Organization to become the AFL-CIO. There are several unions, there's a UAW, United Auto Workers Union today, IAMAW, National Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. Uh, these are the unions of today. And of course, then there's also the AFL-CIO still. Now, union work is, I mean, unions are losing power in droves these days because management is, well, because the nation of workers do management is, uh, hiring what they call salary workers and paying the workers a salary. And of course, salary workers were never part of a union in the first place. Uh, any of you know what I'm talking about? You need to get paid hourly instead of a salary. Yeah, the, the salary, salary worker is uh, like a manager. A but see, also, if you have a certain level of skill, like a computer programmer, IT, he's salary. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. As opposed to a machinist, he's hourly. A person who operates a drill press all day long, drills holes into uh, be into the parts, parts made for maybe a, the parts for a refrigerator, the parts for an automobile, the parts for a train or something. Some men just drill the whole, they're hourly. Uh, the salaried persons are the persons who draw the, uh, uh, well, the drawing people, the uh, well, sometimes drawing people are hourly. But uh, computer programmers, networking, network people, things like that, they're salary. So more and more work has become salary and less and less hourly. And I'll say this, a day you can go into a factory and say, oh, I can do anything and expect you to hire it. You try to hire a place like hockey, you have to have a specific skill that they want at the time. 
well, you might as well forgive it. Now, there are some exceptions. They sometimes hire janitors. Well, they do hire janitors, and they hire laundry room workers, persons who wash the rags when the rags get really dirty. Uh, I mean, Lockheed uses a lot of rags. So those people are hourly. Um, your book talks about one strike after another, the more famous strike being the Haymarket strike. Now, but now, one thing about these strikes now, much too often they resulted in bloodshed. <clears throat> now, before presidents were told that they had to let workers strike and let workers organize, sometimes the presidents of their country, particularly President Hayes, and maybe a few others, would send in soldiers, and the soldiers would do the work, and protect the strike breakers. In other words, you had the strike, the, the, the word for strike breaker is scab. And it sounds like a dirty word to you, but says strike breakers are called scabs. You knew, the workers who worked during the strike were looked down on, and a lot of them were hurt badly, or they were shot, they were killed. Um, people working? People who went to work during the strike. During the strike. So you, in other words, if you, if you were. So they got violent. The strikers got violent. Yeah. The strikers. <laughs> the stri oh, yeah, okay, I want to try to make it clear. If you were a union worker and you went on strike and some of your fellow workers did not strike. I want to make a living. Without you can tell me I can't go make a living. Okay. You can get shot too. Exactly. Uh, okay. Even as a day. Now, now even today, you money. can get hurt doing that. <laughs> I mean, my dad told me, whatever you do, don't ever cross the picket line. And I never had. I mean, I'm 69. I never crossed the picket line. I was told that too. Uh, but, I mean, okay, I, I'm telling this for your own good. These workers can get really, really angry. Because they fight for. They're no, fighting for better wages. working conditions, yeah. better wages. I hope that we just keep standing out in the street and crying about it is not going to get me any more. But well, guess what? Yeah, sometimes it gets them a little bit. Guess what? When they do come off that strike line, they get rid of you. So you just come in and just. Well, are they to get, look, what I'm saying is, is are they the boss? They're the no, that's what I'm saying. The boss is still going to get rid of you. Yeah. They're just using you. Because they need somebody to work at that moment. Yeah. Because they work as a striker. Okay. Uh, hopefully, I'm making it clear. Uh, crossing a picket line is a dangerous thing to do. In your oh yes. Even though when I was, we went, I, I went through two strikes during my 27 years in Lockheed, and there was no violence in either one, but there were some workers who worked during the strike and they were permanently ostracized. And by the rest, of we were told we don't have anything to do with it. We took it. We ignored them socially. And a lot of us did. And one of the men in my department was a scam. I mean, that's, that was the term they used. So basically, he worked during the strike and he was hated for the rest of his life. The union president told us one time, once you're a scam, you're always a scam. You can never get out of being a scam. Um, and generally, the other workers tried as hard much as they could to have as little to do with you as they possibly could. Um, I did not scam. All right, leaving that. Then in Chicago, they set up an ideal city called White City. And like so many of the ideal cities, I mean, the people there generally thought, hey, we can come here and not have to work very hard. But a, well, an, e an economic, economic downturn occurred. And when it did, the White City failed. The White City was depending on a strong economy, apparently. And it failed. Your book shows a picture of it. I mean, I'm on page 507. Uh, was it a white city or city of sin? White city failed like all these other ideal cities have. Um, and again, probably because communal living generally has not worked for people who have tried it. And, uh, all right, your book has the question, who built the cities? Um, uh, most of the answers is they kind of, they sort of built themselves. All right, moving on to chapter 20. I know I'm rushing through, but I can't spend too long on the chapter. Depression and war. Now, the war they're talking about is the Spanish-American War. Now, the Depression. All right. And the farmer has throughout our history had a very, very tough time on it. The more he grows, 
the less he gets for it. And oftentimes the government has told farmers, hey, if you will promise not to grow and show us that you're not growing, we'll pay you. I mean, uh, you've got 20 acres, if you'll only plant 15 of them, we'll pay you to not plant the other five. This has actually happened throughout our history. And any of you aware of it? This actually has happened. And some of my uncles were farmers, and they got paid for letting their land sit and grow in weeds. Uh, they weren't even allowed to put cattle on it because that would be using the land. So uh, they would let their land grow in weeds and let the trees start to grow, and uh, you know, just let it. And they could prove to government, hey, we've let five acres of our 20 acres lie idle, and the government would write out a check. What was the purpose of To rate keep prices up. Oh, okay. In other words, the more they produced, the less they got for it. And this was especially true when farmers started buying tractors and so you get rich on that land and you can have these tractors and reapers and combines all on credit. Oh hey, I'll plant every acre I got. Next thing you do, the price was the price kept going down, price of oats is down, price of wheat is down, price of corn is down. I mean Isn't that price a good thing that huh? people don't have to pay so much for food or pay so much for food. Well, every time it's paid by fundamental economics. You produce more than people need. All right, I'll tell you something happened to me one time. My brother and I went to a Jamaican store, and one of the things we went to buy was bananas. We couldn't. There were so many bananas in that region of Jamaica that they were free. But no, they were, it's, it's, like this. It's, it's, not, it's not about being free. I mean, there has to be a price for everything that you can. No, so there was not an industry. But they, they only, only sell the things that are scarce. They only release 10% of the diamonds they find in Africa to keep the price up. Yeah, they, 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 the, the less there is, the more the bigger, the more the price you get for them. Right. And when you put so out too many, well, my question is, wouldn't it be a good thing that, that your people don't have to pay as much for food or pay as much for things? Well, uh, look, in the case of Jamaica, the bananas were shipped overseas, where the people in England and Canada and the United States paid a price for it. But that's where they got their money. But as far as paying, eating, I mean, as far as eating them there, they would just pull them off one at a time and eat them off the farmers without, you know, they, they, they weren't, I'm trying to make, well, they weren't selling. Okay. They couldn't sell. So we couldn't buy them. Again, um, and the farmer, now, I'll say this too, I just read recently, I mean, I, I try to do a lot of reading, that the highest, our suicides are up. But the highest percentage of people who are committing suicide today are the farmers. They're still, and the farmers, I mean, on paper, there's a lot of American farmers are millionaires. They've got these huge, huge, well, your small farmer was longer up of it. These huge, huge, and these tractors that cost $100,000 a piece. The tractors, unlike the old ones, they're air conditioned. I mean, they're, and they're, they have places to put your water and sandwiches and refrigeration even. But the farmer barely can make his budget meet. And if there's a slight little drought, he's hurting. Now, my sister can tell you, I mean, there was a couple, of, well, about three or four years ago, the spring rains came in Ohio, and the farmers couldn't plow because the ground was soggy. And finally, the ground dried up just enough for them to plow. I had to hurry up. The day was Sunday. But the farmers had to, even though some of them were very religious, they had to forget about church. Hey, it's, if we don't get this plowing done right now, it's going to be too late. So they hurried, they plowed, and the next day the rain right. came. But, 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 at least they had their plowing done. They, they were able to go ahead and grow the, the plowing and plant, and uh, but it was a close call for them. In other words, farmers are dependent on the weather. They're dependent on things that are totally beyond their control. And of course, to some extent, we all are. Anyway, the farmers decided for a while to unite. They formed the Farmers Alliance. The idea was to make sure that uh, everybody was charging a higher price for the food. No, they wouldn't let farm, certain farmers come in and undercut you. Uh, now see, there was a case of this couple who were living on Social Security, so they could grow a few eggs and had a cow and sell the milk at a lower price, but they got all kinds of threatening letters. And they finally just decided for their own sake they better stop. So they stopped selling their eggs because, again, they could not cut everybody they, because they were getting this money from the government. Uh, so they could charge less for their eggs and milk than anybody else was. But it created a it created a bad blood between them and their neighbors. There was the populist movement, um, very very um, important at the time, where the people got together 
and said, we're going to get some reforms. And they began pushing for reforms. Out of the populist movement came things like the direct primary. OK, popular, this is all right. Eventually, now from the populist came to things like the direct primary, where the people forced, in order they said, forget about the, the party bosses picking the candidates. We're going to pick the candidates. <clears throat> and then they got laws passed called the referendum where that if, if I don't like a law, we're going to veto laws we don't like. 